Hi everyone. Hi once. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, folks. Um, everyone, welcome to the uh, largest, fastest growing, and the most active uh, large scale Scrum uh, meetup. Uh, or originated in New York City, the Big Apple, but also having gone global and viral, virally global. Uh, today, we have a very special guest, uh, my good friend and colleague from Finland, uh, Wolf, uh, Wolf, Wolfgang Stevens. Um, He's a passionate, energetic, and inspiring coach with uh, many years of experience working in large-scale, lean, and agile global product development. Uh, his learning journey started well, all the way back in 2005 uh, when he was introduced to Scrum and Agile. He coached various organizations uh, throughout his career, uh, doing less adoptions uh, from 2007 and onwards. And um, he certainly has a lot of insight to share with us. He's one of very few uh, globally uh, certified less trainers and um, every less trainer comes um, also uh, in the same uh, bottle with being a coach. So uh, you get in two for the buck. Um, I would like to pass the baton over to Wolfie. Uh, he's a great entertaining and engaging speaker and uh, he will answer all the questions after the fact. Wolfie, please uh, okay. take it away. Yep. Thanks. So I need to. You remember. can start sharing. Yes. Uh, all right. So you should see this now. Let me Perfect. Window back to here. Okay. So uh, hello, everybody. Um, thanks for the nice intro. So what is this all about? Uh, it's about how you can organize your or structure your organization for agility. And this whole uh, concept or this whole, let's say, uh, talk here started actually as an experience report for one of the major conferences in Europe. This was XP 2022 last year. So if you want to read the entire report, then it's on my website. You find the link here. And you will also get the material, so you don't have to type it now, uh, and then you can read the entire thing. So uh, quickly about me, uh, already uh, <clears throat> Gene said a few words. Well, I'm born in Germany, you might hear. Yeah? And um, I did some programming there and moved 94 to Finland. Ever since I live in Finland, I worked then about 10 years as program and project manager and also as like a project manager coach, basically helping the other program managers in Nokia Networks at that time uh, to, to basically become better at their job. By the way, Nokia Networks is this part of Nokia, which was still alive here. Yeah? Nokia Mobile Phones was the one which was bankrupt. It was a different division. Uh, I transitioned then in 2005 to uh, become more and more an agile coach. Of course, the interesting uh, actually how this was started was that uh, Greg and Buzz have met 2005 and they came to, to our department. I was head of program management at this time. And, and then basically said, okay, and mm -hmm. if we introduce Scrum, you don't need program yeah. managers anymore. Yeah? So that was um, very strange for me. So, and anyway, the learning curve started there. Uh, then 2013, I decided there is more in life. So I quit actually my job after 20 years and I traveled around the world. So I was altogether almost a year in the US. Um, of course, not at one piece because of the visa. So I traveled all the way from New York to uh, Vancouver or to, to Seattle and shortly to Canada and then all the way to Arizona and then to, to Mexico. This was just the part through uh, the US, but the whole journey lasted three years and was around half the world. And then when I come back, actually, I was able to introduce less in one insurance company. And then I became a less trainer. And since 2020, I have my own company called Kai Kako. So let's have a look at uh, what actually is this all about. So let's start to clear some, some basics first. Um, so what is Agile? What do we mean by Agile? And uh, sometimes the word is pretty much overloaded. So I would like to keep it simple. As Alistair had put it here, it's the ability of an organization to move and change direction quickly and with ease. And if this is something what you need to have because of your business environment, yeah, and this would be, for example, the motivational reason, yeah, so why people want to become agile. But what does it now mean, really? We will see soon. 
So how does it start for many companies, at least I have been in, uh, they have first typically a scrum pilot. No, most likely many of you already have been uh, or are beyond this point. But anyway, so this where often where it started. So there was a team very, uh, let's say, isolated from the rest of the organization. And they have tried out Scrum. There was then just one product owner and a bunch of people there working. And basically, this was successful in most of the cases. There was benefits what we have seen. So then the big boss is saying, yes, let's all go agile. Now we want to have this for everybody. And what then typically happens in the organization is what we call a copy-paste approach or a multi-scrum team approach, or we are scaling scrum. Yeah? And, and this is actually um, seen by some of the elements which you might actually face today. This means that you have a real product, but then actually each and every team will have an owned product owner. Yeah? That's why in parentheses you have a team product owner. And you have a team product backlog. And this you do then actually n times. But what does it now mean? I mean, are we agile with this? So let's make an example. Uh, imagine just for a simple example, you have an online shop. Now in this online shop, you have now created those teams and you say, hey, we have a front-end team, we have a back-end team, a UX team, and so on and so on. Yeah. And now each team actually has their own backlog and each team has their own product owner. And you might think, hey, this is just working great. But what do you really have if you look at this? So, so what is happening in such an organization? Basically, those organizations, they are facing a lot of dependencies between those teams. So because when I'm, let's say, uh, let's take Amazon as an example. Uh -huh. Amazon online shop, and if I now want to say, I want to pay with uh, PayPal. So this is a new feature. It doesn't exist today. So typically this kind of features are requiring work from several of these components. Yeah? So from front end, some from back end, database, whatever. Yeah? So what you now create in this kind of environment is you have a lot of dependencies and this means you need coordinators. Yeah? You have again this that actually this customer centric requirement needs to be broken down so that these teams can be spoon fed because of course the front end team can only do front end. Yeah. So what actually comes uh, and and then yeah so you have basically delays in the system. You create of lots, lots of waste. Yeah, and sometimes you have ping pong effect. So this is actually quite quite typical uh, for many organizations. So. You get all sorts of problems there. And until you really get a feature done, it takes quite some time and effort. Now you ask yourself, how agile are you? So how easy is it in this kind of organization to change direction easily and quickly? It's not very easy. Sometimes the front end guys are overloaded and let's say the platform guys are just doing nothing. They are how do you say here in Germany or in, in Europe? So they are polishing the gold edges, yeah, stuff like this. Uh, or other way around it, the backend team is completely down under and, and, and can't keep up with all the most important work. And maybe the UX team is just having a good time. They could almost go to vacation. Yeah. So you have a very, very unbalanced system, what you get. The work is very unbalanced. Yeah? And agility actually is far, far away from this. Okay. So one of the concepts which is actually crucial here is this of a product definition or product group. Yeah? And what does it mean actually is this that, well, you, you organize the people and the components and whatever you have so that basically uh, those who are working together or who need to work together to develop a product, they are actually working together. And now uh, some examples. So let's say in insurance company, you have basically one big product. That's the insurance. A, a bank has one big product. That's banking. Yeah. So and or you have this web shop that would be, for example, a, a product. Yeah. Something like this. So product definitions are, are, are quite interesting, uh, and they should help you actually to structure your organization. Yeah. Once you have found them. Now. 
let's assume that we are now going with this web online shop as our product. So what do we now have? If we now organize around this, this means we are having one real uh, uh, product backlog because one backlog is enough basically. So all the items, what we have to do are in there. We have one product owner who can actually manage this. And then you have feature teams, yeah? So what are feature teams? Um, well, they are basically cross-functional, cross-component teams who can do all sorts of work. And they are also stable and long-lived. So this means you can, they are working together for, for many, many years, five, six, 10 years working together easily. Yeah, And those teams, they are now capable to take a requirement and get it done. Yeah. So they can take this requirement, hey, I want to pay with PayPal, and they can basically get it done alone without any dependencies to any other team. That's the ideal state. Yeah. And now again, ask yourself, hey, how is our agility in this kind of organization? Well, if you imagine that all the teams, we have only a handful here, like six teams, for example, yeah, in theory, all the teams can do any kind of work. You are extremely flexible. You can, you can throw at the teams whatever you want as a product owner. There will be always teams who say, okay, we have still capacity, we can do this. Yeah. Um, and, and then basically, so you get uh, the most valuable stuff done. Yeah. And this is basically what you want to have. Yeah. So you want to have agility as a means so that what as an end, what you achieve is you, you always get highest value for the customer. Okay, now uh, there were some organizations we said, yeah, Wolfie, this is old stuff what you're telling us. We are already using full stack developers and this is all perfect, yeah? So let's have a look at this one. Let's imagine now that we have here uh, product backlog items. So we have our one product backlog but now those product backlog, and we have these feature teams, yeah. But now this one, this this product backlog items um, are such that, for example, the one team can only do on payment system, or the other can only do something else. And what this now leads to is that, as you can see here, um, the the team A or only only team A can work on the orange items. And only team B can work on the black items. So what do you now actually get is a system, again, where you have individual lists. It's not one list. Yes, it's one explicit list, but you still have implicit lists. Yeah. And I give you an example. So this is a real life example from an insurance company. Uh, it was about uh, contract underwriting, so about online insurances. So you could purchase your vehicle insurance or other insurances at this company. And what they now had, they had three uh, teams and they were very, very, very independent. Yeah? So what happened now, there was uh, one team for household, household insurances, one team for vehicle insurance and one team for life insurance. Okay, sounds good, doesn't it? Yeah, you think clear responsibilities, we know what we want to do and all this. But now again, look at agility. How agile is this organization? And what happened now was that the most pressing backlog items were all in the vehicle insurance. That was basically what was the most important stuff to do. And what now happened was, as you can see in the backlog here, only team B could work on these items. So only team B was able to work on this product high, highest uh, importance uh, product backlog items. And all the other teams, even though they were feature teams, even though they could make this feature and by themselves without dependencies to other teams, get it done. It was still so that actually this was a low agility. So they could have done even better than that. Yeah. But this was the reality, at least in this organization. So just by saying that, hey, we have feature teams, uh, we have full stack teams, it is not yet most likely enough. Most likely you can still do much, much better if you really want to go for more agility. Now, um, 
All right, if you're asking a question, please do so. Otherwise, please, Karen, could you please mute yourself? Apologies, Wolfie, please go on. Now, the interesting part is that most likely you are thinking, hey, yes, that's obvious. Uh, why why don't we do it like this? Yeah, And um, it is so that this seems to be very, very difficult for organizations to do. Otherwise, we wouldn't we would be in different situation. Yeah, there would be uh, uh, stuff like less everywhere. So why is this so difficult? Yeah, well, the thing is this that organizations are complex systems. Yeah? If we start with this one, and the the the, trick, the tricky part is that in complex systems, we have very very hard time to understand all these connections. Yeah. And how, how does it come that this is influencing other variables? Now, if we do a decision here, and now all of a sudden something else is happening there. And that's why we actually need to do systems thinking. And most managers I meet, most scrum masters I meet, most agile coaches I meet, and I'm talking really about 90x percent figure here, they don't have a clue about system thinking. Yeah about the systems modeling in order to understand what actually are the consequences of having, for example, full stack teams, which they can work very independently, yeah? and, and all these kind of things. And then the next thing is this, that, well, any system has an optimization goal. Either you make it explicit in the sense of this is where you want to go, or implicit it will happen because the system is stable. It's not oscillating. Your organization is stable to some extent. So it's op it is optimized for something. But the question is, is it optimized for what you want it to be? Hmm? And to make this again clear, and for example, one optimization goal might be agility, yeah? uh, to make this basically clear and then optimize your system towards this goal, this is something, again, what I'm seeing or what I'm not seeing in, in, in many organizations. Yeah. So they just do something and they hope that it will work out. And in this sense, basically, um, the, the, the biggest leverage you have in uh, changing the behavior in the system is the structure. So this means that um, some, some people think, hey, we need to have this uh, uh, cultural change program or something like this, yeah? Or we want to have different processes, only this or whatever. Uh, this is all nice thinking. Uh, most likely it won't work, yeah? Because the, even, even the best people, uh, uh, when you put them into this system and they are forced to, to work a certain way, uh, they, they will not be able to change it. So that's why what you need to understand is that, hey, how is my system working and what structural changes can I do in order to optimize my system for what I want so that this is then supporting my business strategy. And uh, this is then uh, uh, very crucial. So those are the structural elements. Now, what are those structural elements? Well, uh, this is basically stuff like you have a product definition as broad as possible. You have basically defined how which people are working uh, for this particular product now. No? And in this way, you have uh, a clear, clear one real product backlog. You have one product owner who can do this. You have those feature teams, which can still do end-to-end -end work. Now, many organizations don't even have that one. Yeah? They have a lot of dependencies. So, then you you focus on technical excellence. Yeah, I mean uh, this is this is over and over again where also here people say, hey, Scrum isn't working, and then they are trying Kanban. Yeah, and and they have technical depth like I don't know from from for, for many many years to be working on. Yeah, so don't underestimate if your if your architecture doesn't doesn't allow you to be agile, then your organization is structure. Your organization, organization structure can be what they want, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, the, it will not help. Yeah, so focus definitely on technical excellence. Yeah, 
And then when you have, uh, and you need the definition of done, of course, uh, that we know when stuff is done. And of course, management support also lacking in many, many organizations. In many reports I have read actually say that the management was not behind the change. And that also is something I, I have seen in a, in a few organizations, at least, that uh, wh why do you want to become agile? And, and the answer is very often sometimes, yeah, because you need to do this now. Yeah, like, like it, it's a fashion stuff still. And, and what's, the real, what's the real driver behind? So because if you are not uh, required to change, the change will not happen. Uh, there is something freely translated uh, uh, from from German: uh, "Wash me, but don't make me wet." Yeah. So it's a lot of wishful thinking. Yeah? So wishful thinking that the change might just magically happen. Sorry, dear managers in this audience or whoever listens to this later on. Yeah. Change starts from you. You need to start the change. Yeah. You have to lead this. And then as it is an experience report, just a, a, a quick uh, notation on this one. So for all the coaches here and scrum masters, uh, especially for, for the, the external coaches, yeah. Um, for me, it was a very interesting learning curve that um, uh, I tried a lot and uh, it didn't happen. Yeah? And I actually felt a lot of frustration also in this because uh, I, I just want to help the people, help the organizations, but not every person, not every organization really wants the help you can offer them. Yeah? So that was one of the personal takeaways from this. Okay, and uh, that was about it. Uh, so if you want to do more, then for example, in, in, in my class, I don't know about jeans classes, I'm doing this kind of system modeling, as you can see here. So these are like uh, three days uh, where we are just standing there and doing system modeling. And uh, people typically take a lot away, especially when you then later on uh, summarize this and then you say, okay, within one minute you can walk this through and then it becomes crystal clear actually. And uh, I don't know who is here from Europe or if you have willing to travel, uh, just a quick advertisement still, the less conference where you will see many, many great people this year and we also go far beyond less. We invite Pierre de Borgsnes from uh, Beyond Budgeting. He will come and a few others. And um, yes, this will be a great event. So I can only encourage you to, uh, to come there and uh, experience a team-based conference. Yeah. Okay. And uh, well, if you want to read some more about this, this is uh, some reading material. And um, I'm very... Happy to connect also via LinkedIn or so if you want to do this. And that was basically all what I had already. So now it would be time for questions. Sure, short and sweet and to the point. Thank you very much, Wolfie. Folks, uh, and now you can unmute yourself carefully and ask questions. Before that, I was trying to chase you down to keep your mics off. Now you can turn them on or just raise your yellow hands and... Uh, well, if you can pick from from the list, yeah. And there are oh, some. We go already. Uh, I don't see there are any. So let's just not type in, folks. If you have any question, any questions, just raise a hand or unmute and ask. Uh, so, Stephens, I have one question. Um, I mean, I have a similar discussion with my APG and like how we can make uh, more independent teams, like you know, so that the the main, uh, the goal of the intent of having an agile is to kind of work independently so that less coordination and less, you know, decoupling of systems, right? But the some of those uh, uh, conversation, uh, and and it, I, I, in my own opinion also, I feel like that's a reasonable thing uh, to hear that they say that like, since that system is so complex, we would like to separate like UAD team or separate, you know, this team so that they can like you know carry out certain processes so the dependency is kind of to make sure because it's such a crucial complex system that confidence level is not there that the, the team itself can provide those test cases so that we do not require separate individual team which is capable of doing some some skills which is required for the end-to-end -end delivery of the product right so 
how to how do we get that level of confidence how do we uh, inculcate uh, so that they, they they kind of buy in this idea of having independent teams self organizing teams cross skill teams um where there are several ways how to get there um the first one is that you make a simulation game um there are several there is a there is a, some some games what you can play um like ubango you can modify this and then you can experience how this goes uh you can play lego it's really much fun and uh, you can actually simulate this kind of things and then the people will experience the difference so you can then modify the setups and then people will experience this so that is one way to do it of course the other way is that you actually uh, start with your organization and you form the, the teams and you make an experiment and you have to remember that this, this is all about experimenting there is not this is the thing and go for it and it will be uh, put in stone forever no this is all about experimenting yeah so you have to find your own way and in this way um uh, make an experiment and then see how it works so so just a follow up question so what will happen to those teams suppose we so are in the scrum right we are expecting uh the development team to do everything end to end right so if we have a separate team in 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 past who used to do a certain stuff for us and they are only they can only do certain stuff they cannot start developing the code they that's not their skills right so what will happen to those resources well the the the, the so, point if i got it right is that of course you when you form those teams then actually you actually dissolve this testing team and you integrate this testers or the architects or analysts whatever yeah you integrate them into one team so let me let me show this here again uh hold on a moment uh, da, 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 da. and there was one question in the chat no okay here um so what you would do is that okay that uh this is like front end back end ux design database yeah uh, finance logic, uh, platform team, whatever. So you would actually form a new team consisting of these people. And 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 this this you can do within a couple of hours. I have done this already several times. So it doesn't take more than a couple of hours. And then you have new teams. Yeah, like and then I you have, put them to work. I have worked with several teams where we have like UX designers and you know even the analyst in the same team. But they cannot, so we cannot ask them to be cross skilled because the UX cannot likely, they don't likely to code it, right? And the same thing. I, I haven't said that they need to code, but they are just a part of the team. And then it stuff will happen. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So huh? that is one way. Like, you know, then we can't say that they are, the, the whole team is cross skilled, right? I mean, I mean, not individual member can do everything. No, no, we, we don't want generalists. Uh, I think this time has passed where we can survive with generalists. Uh, so the UX person can still do the UX, but maybe the UX person can also do a little bit in the front end. Or the UX person can do analysis. Or the UX person can help in testing where you just need hands. Yeah, You just need to click test cases. All this is possible. Yeah, But the whole point is this. <clears throat> you move the coordination responsibility within the team now. You don't need any more external coordinators. That's why the, the, the one product owner is sufficient yeah? because this product owner, the real product owner takes care of the business, not mm -hmm. any more team coordination. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. And I got a question. Answers the question. Okay, uh, this answers the question. Uh, what is FL? So finance logic platform and so on. Yeah. Okay. Um, Edwin, what is you? You have your hand. <laughs> no. Good evening. Sorry. Um, okay. Question. So I did my last course I think five years ago with Greg, and I remember that he said so if um. A company or department wants to go for a less transformation 
it's important that also uh, higher management comes to my training for three days. I can imagine that um, it can be quite a step. So um, if you look at more an incremental approach, what, what steps would you advise to make it less frightening and make smaller steps towards um, well, uh, a less approach? Yeah. Um, Greg has his way. It's Greg's way. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, <laughs> or the highway. Oh, no. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, I, I'm, I'm looking more forward to, to, uh, to, to see what, what they are capable to do. Let's say, for example, in, in one organization, I had a, a, the normal three-day class, and then we had a one-day management workshop where I was just focusing on, on some of the aspects and, and, and like basically holding up the mirror and so that they understood, okay, yes, we have plenty of theory X in all our organization. Yes, we have plenty of waste in our organization. Yeah? And then they figured out all this by themselves. And then they said, oh, darn, we have to do something about it. Yeah? So, and then you get the momentum. Yeah? Um, there are, I think there are many ways which, which lead to a success. Uh, uh, Bus, for example, is a great believer in the grassroots uh, movement. Yeah, so um, there's the op the absolute opposite. Yeah, it, it, um, and, it came back to the Netherlands. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I have I have seen this. I mean, uh, Bus was a uh, the same organization where I was working, and uh, yes, I have seen this there. And then, of course, at some point of time, the the bigger bosses became interested in this whole thing. Yeah, and then they, then they started to learn on their own. Yeah. Does this answer your question? Yeah, 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 it does. Thank you. Yeah, and I, I met Alexei uh, last week together with Boss, and they had a similar answer. So, uh, okay. Uh, thank you. Then, uh, Coach Vadim, <laughs> I think is. Uh, yeah, uh, thank you so much. Uh, I just would like to, to ask a question. Uh, you mentioned uh, one of the uh, key component of less, right? Uh, concept of one product owner for one product. I love this concept, but I'm just wondering, uh, you know, I'm dealing with uh, even somehow agilist mindset of management, but as soon as they, they can hear that one product owner for one product, they start screaming. Yes. They said, hold on a minute. Who is going to be helping teams with, with user story and prioritization? And I said, hey, you know, we can train your developers to be wonderful, uh, uh, you know, user story writers, uh, and they still they still kind of scream. Uh, can what what is your um, like sixty seconds um, elevated speech well, about it? <laughs> if you could for, share, for example, there was an interesting story from some other colleague of mine, and what they did was that the people insisted on having this team product owner, which were the analysts. Yeah, those people were doing analysis work. But what they did was that they moved them into the teams. So now this analyst, this team product owners, were team members, basically. And uh, you, you already have in your organization, I'm, I'm pretty sure you do have in your organization already today, somebody, one person, or max two or three, who are depend on the size of your product, who are telling which features are in and which are out. And this is your product owner. Yeah. So that, that means that that if you have, and uh, some other example, uh, uh, just to, to make this point, uh, there was um, one product owner, he was the co-founder. Yeah, he, he became then first the head of R&D, then he actually said, no, I need to be product owner now. So, and he was the co-founder and he's now working as one product owner with 13 teams. Yeah? So the point is this, that, that if you really know your business, this is the product owner. Yeah? And, and what you need to come away from is this kind of technical analyst requirements engineer, however this is called, yeah? who, is, who is focusing on writing user stories. That's team's job. The product owner focuses on the business, no? makes decisions like, should we go to China or not? Should we go to the US with our product or not? No? 
should yeah i mean th these are these are the big decisions a product owner is doing yeah and th this kind of analysis work it goes more and more to the teams yeah in the beginning of course there is still more cooperation but then later on as the teams grow and they are more used to this they can even take more load away from the product owner but the interesting part is this that yes um i i hear you um that this is something like like uh, uh, imagine that all of a sudden you have a third dimension and now you can talk three-dimensional it's sheer impossible for you to go back and think two-dimensional but you cannot imagine or you have a hard time imagining it beforehand yeah? and again there are simulation games you can make it easier there are experiments and just try it out and stuff like this and you will see what magic can happen there i hope this helps thank you thank you that was very important okay. Let me... then i see a hand from karen i hope i pronounced this correct now <laughs> I will there, say, go ahead. I'm going. So many, many uh, pieces to put this puzzle together, right? Thank you. Uh, I do organizational change. And, you know, I'm <clears throat> looking back to when you said that, you know, the focus is on structure. And, you know, the biggest leverage is structure. And that is a huge leverage point. However, um, you know, without the culture, I mean, the person who brought up the fact of, um, you know, they, they, when you bring these teams together, no, the UX is not going to do coding, but it is a different mindset, right, that they have to adapt. And you were talking about, you know, the different games that they can play. And to me, that is a, a, a pathway for them you know, to develop different mindsets and ways of working, which are part of the culture. And so I see like, you know, the structure and the culture as, you know, very intricately interwoven because, you know, how do you have the right structure if you don't have the right mindset that's going to create that structure? And so that is then a different um, typical mindset or culture. So well, I'm okay. curious as to what, you know, you, you, you yeah. Yeah. stated that. Uh, I have two, two different, uh, from two different di directions, actually. So the, we are talking about uh, large organizations here. And in large organizations, we have realized uh, that culture follows structure. So if you want to change the behavior of people, you need to change the structure, you need to change the system. And that's not something actually what Les has invented. Look at Deming, look at Akov, look at Seton, all these great system thinkers, they will all say the same thing. If you change the system, the behavior of people will change. Yeah. Hopefully to do better, of course, yeah? because you can also make a system worse. Yeah. So, but now, now think about this: that that uh, if if this is the case, then what happens typically is that because of this different way of working, what you now have, like in this example with the team member, so now you have a different constellation, and what typically happens there is that um, the social pressure actually starts to kick in. And very interesting own dynamics are actually happening there. And because of those kind of, of uh, basically side effects, which are there, yeah, you actually will create a very different working culture. So it doesn't happen overnight. The structural changes happen overnight, literally. Yeah? So you just decide from tomorrow on, uh, we work like this. This means you have a, a, a four, four mm -hmm. hour self-selling team workshop where you then create the new teams and then actually you go. Yeah? Um, and, and that is happening there. Huh? Now, the other side is this, that if you, if you look at startups, startups typically are lacking structure. Mm -hmm. the, the culture is more dominant. 
And if you are working in a startup, what you then actually see is that uh, pretty soon they need structure. Yeah. So uh, in, in, in the startup setup, uh, you actually will figure out that it's it's at some point of time it's getting too chaotic and you need more structure. Yeah. And and then uh, then it 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 the structure is building up, building up, building up. And then if you change, if you then look at the potential evolution of a company from seven people, ten people, yeah, up to uh, thousands of people then the structure is starting to dominate more and more. Yeah. And then actually you, you have more people on board. They don't have this mindset, what this 10 people in the beginning had. Anyway, they have their own. So, and then actually what happens is that if you then want to change the way of working in the organization, then you have to change the structure again. And you have to work on the system. Yeah. Right. But I mean, the person in the larger organization that is starting the structure changes, haven't they started to make that mental shift and change, you know, their vision of what culture is, right? We have to have a different way of thinking. And, and this, you know, the structure then is, to me, a reflection of the change in their mindset. Well, it um... it's like, you know, which came first? I, the I, don't, or the I don't think I don't think it, it's something new. I mean, in this way, that the there are some some evidence is there that how how do you work best? Well, in small teams. So then you have close cooperation. You have you have fast feedback cycle. You have quick communication, quick decision making. Those are all aspects which are actually helping you to increase productivity in the end of the day. And, and then, um, then the point is this, that, okay, then you look at your organization, then you say, okay, how do we get from where we are today to where we want to be? So in this way, yes, uh, uh, management is required uh, to have a vision that how, how should our organization work? Do we want to have slaves in our organization or do you want to have inno uh, people who can innovate? No? Uh, I think that's a fair question. Yeah. Uh, if, if, if you want to have people who are working like robots and slaves then go ahead. Yeah. I'm just not willing to work there, but that's a different story. Of course, they're legitimate. Why not? They are not against the law. But uh, then the question is that in the context of agility, now your business needs agility. Your business, because of the surrounding conditions you are in, of this VUCA world we are in, now your, your business, your organizational setup must be such that you can quickly and easily change direction. So then the question is, how do you do that? And for that, hopefully you have management who knows what needs to be done. You have other people, you have personal managers, you have scrum masters, you have or you have coaches or whatever other interested people, uh, developers, whoever, yeah, uh, interested people who say, hey, this is something we could test out. I mean, so has scrum started in many organizations. Yeah, hey, this sounds like a good idea. Let's try it out and then see what happens. Yeah. Thank uh, you. Does this help? Yeah. Uh-huh. I, 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 again, you know, there's somebody somewhere that is saying uh, this is not working and they're shifting, right? They're shifting. I, uh, I... Okay. Uh, uh, and, and quick add-on and then we come to the next uh, question. Um, uh, so, for example, uh, I encourage you to come to the list classes and then you learn how to do, for example, systems modeling. And then you have a problem with in the organization. People, manager says we have a problem, and then you start creating systems models. And then the people will figure out, oh darn, yes, this is what we want. This is where we are. These are the problems. They are the, the, the knobs which we can turn. And now we realize that if we put more pressure, no, we get less quality, we get more, more bugs and stuff like this. Yeah. And this is your tool, actually, what I have found out very, very powerful. And I have done this many times in critical situations, in retros, 
where management had a complete different thinking and they were bashing developers and all sorts of nasty situations. Yeah. So do systems modeling. Yeah. I, and, I have this, the, uh, yeah. you know, the fifth discipline and, uh, you know, the fifth discipline, uh, you know, a uh, resource book. So I, I'm a system modeler uh, advocate. Okay. And there is your tool. Then you can start talking with people. And it's fun. Yes, it is. Okay. Uh, okay. Next question. Yeah. I can't speak. Uh, Dais, Daira, Saria. <laughs> Yeah, you can call me Anu, Stephen. Thank you. So yeah, it's like continuing to uh, on the previous question which I asked and then Karen also added. So like in my experience, when I saw that the, in the team, we included the data analyst, the UX research and the UX design and then developers like uh, IT coding programmers, I would say. So what we saw that like we tried to do it system, we tried to deliver the value in one sprint. I'm so sorry if you're hearing the noise, my kids are crazy. So, uh, so yeah. So basically what we saw that we are following waterfall within scrum teams, within our sprint. Yeah. So in yeah. one sprint, we will be, we'll have, uh, the, the, the UX research guys talking to multiple people in another screen, uh, based on that output, we are, the designers are taking and making designs and then the, the next yeah. sprint, because it goes through compliance and a lot of other stuff, right? So ultimately, we are not producing end-to-end -end value to our customers in one sprint, like, like from the definition of Scrum, right? So that's where, yep. that's the way that that was the workaround. And that also created a lot of internal, you know, stuff like, I, I don't know whether we are suited for a Scrum team or not, like multiple times that question have been uh, put there. So I want to understand your views on that. Well, um, of course, I'm lacking a lot of context here, um, but basically I, I have seen this a lot, people yeah. doing like this. And then the question is, okay, where is the Scrum Master? And is the Scrum Master competent? Yeah, uh, Where is the Scrum Master here to coach the team to then actually help them to figure out, hey, how do we work? And then to understand that, hey, we need to work in parallel. It's not anymore that we just put our old way of working, our waterfall now into a mini waterfall within the two weeks time boxes. So, but we have to have a different way of working, yeah? And and where we do things more in parallel, yeah? And then actually this, this requires some time to learn um, but not endless either. No? So I, I would say that with a good Scrum Master, um, you actually can, it takes like three sprints, four sprints, then this starts to flow. It's not much more than this. But here an interesting note, a good Scrum Master for me is somebody who will not only get 80 or 100 euros an hour. These are not, in my opinion, good Scrum Masters. Those are Chaira secretaries or stuff like this, yeah, and they don't actually have a clue what Scrum mastering is all about. Just my experience. Yeah? So be careful with this. So what you need to have is good Scrum masters who can really help the team to develop. That's actually also in Peter Sanchez's book um, that if you have a, a kind of a lower performing team and you have a bad Scrum master or bad coach it makes the team even worse, significantly worse. Yeah? But that's why you what you want to have is a good scrum master, a good coach, and then actually it starts to, to flow. That was a great powerful comment. Thank you, Wolfie. Folks, uh, we got five, I would say four to five uh, minutes before we have to wrap this up. I would like to let people off before their next session. We'll take another question, perhaps, if you would like. Let's see if there was something in the chat also. Oh, there isn't a question. Azem, Azem, Azem is ra raising, Azem. Okay. I have one that's, that's hopefully quick. Uh, thank you everyone for your time, first and foremost. I was just wondering, do you have any recommendations for getting people or trying to help management get teams to go towards feature teams? 
Like we, at my company for one, I would say product, maybe we have like 30 teams right now. And I was wondering if you have any recommendations of maybe there's a slower process of combining some teams together first and yes. doing it that way, or if there's another idea that you can share. Yes. So there are two approaches basically in less. So if you talk about 30 teams, it's not any more, less is less huge. And the recommendation in less huge is to do, we introduce requirement areas, so customer centric requirement areas. Like for example, in insurance, it could be like your vehicle insurance is one requirement area and they are working 10 people, then your life insurance no, or whatever you have. Uh, what was it? What was the in industry? Was it insurance or bank? Or what? Human capital management is us. So workforce management specifically okay. um, is mine. Okay. So uh, like scheduling, payroll, HR, uh, timesheet, stuff like that. Okay. Uh, yeah. I don't. So quite it's quite. Think it's quite large. Right. <laughs> anyway, uh, so so uh, that that is the, the the one idea. So that you start with one requirement area around 50, 60 people. No? So like max eight teams, roughly. And then you get them to work. You do this for three months. Yeah? And then you get them to work. And then you start the next one, and then the next one. Yeah? This is one idea. The other thing is that what we do uh, in less, it's called feature team adoption map. Or you can also do a feature heat map, basically, to figure out, OK, for the upcoming next, let's say, three months, how should our organization look like? So that you then say, okay, with the feature team adoption map, we combine those teams. So we make like out of uh, component one, component two, two teams, we make one team which can do both component one and component two. Yeah? With the idea behind, of course, that then these people start to a little bit learn from each other and the knowledge is spreading and so on. Yeah. So, and, uh, but this, this takes much more time. Yeah? No worries about this. But that would be uh, one idea so that you just get this helping hands because typically the other ones can help a lot. So that would be then the idea with the feature team adoption map approach. So that especially in less huge, there you would change more gradually, but on a broader scale. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, the other thing is this, and that's an interesting story also. I was once giving at a huge uh, German um, uh, automobile company a training. Then I asked people, why are you here? Guess what was the answer? My boss told me to come. Yeah, I don't Absolutely. know. Absolutely. <laughs> yes, my boss <laughs> told me boss. to be here. Yeah. And and you know, guys, that's already it. You know, I hit so hard to come out of this hole again. So instead of this, uh, I, I think the uh, the approach which I like to advertise is this: that a, key, a couple of key people in a company they say, "Hey, this is a great idea. Let's try it out." And basically, they would invite everybody to go to a training, and then they say, "This is what we want to try out." But we have learned that you need to understand first what this is all about. And once you understood what this is all about, after everybody has been through, then we make together a decision. How do we want to do Do we want to do this at all? How we want to do this? And then you will hear the concerns and the worries of the people and you can deal with them. Yeah? So this would be a theory Y approach to introducing such a change in your organization. Eh? Theory X approach would be management decided, we do this now and uh, you must follow. Eh? So, and then you get this kind of behavior that people say, oh, I'm just working here and I'm just following what the boss says. Yeah? And then you don't get this enthusiasm in the organization. And you will always have enough skeptics. So that's okay, but no worries. Yeah. They will vanish yeah. over time. Yeah, and yeah, there that, will that, be some that. people who don't like it and they will leave the company. That's also okay. No worries. Or they find some other better job in the same company if the company is big enough. Yeah, that, that's awesome. Thank you. That was that was a wonderful answer. I appreciate your time. Yeah. Hey, folks. Uh, well, uh, thank you once again. Uh, um, as I'm thinking for the question, um, we actually need to wrap up because um, uh, we do have a hard stop. We will just have dramatically a high drop at, at one o'clock anyway. So I want to wrap this up for now, folks. Thank you for joining. And I want to give a special shout out and thanks once again to uh, Wolfie. Um, 
uh, it was great. It was very energizing and um, I think you got a lot of attention here. Um, all of the um, references and assets will be posted um, once Wolfie sends me his uh, assets, the, the deck and other, anything else, please go ahead and do it. And the recording will be available hopefully sometime later today over the weekend or, or, or over the weekend. So I want to thank you all for joining. I enjoy the rest of the day and the upcoming weekend. So thank you. And let's do more with less. All right. Okay. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Bye. -bye. Great. <laughs> thank you. Cheers.